I ask you this morning, what are the things that you are grateful for, you know, in life? Are you grateful for just the things that you can see? Are you grateful for both the things that you can see as well as the things that are on the that, that are within? Do you are you grateful for only those things that money can buy? Are you grateful for the gifts that flow from heaven? Are you grateful for the people of your life or grateful for the relationship you have with the Lord God? There are many things in life that we can be grateful for that is beyond uh, the, from the naked eye of those things that we can see. Uh, God is a good God as he's proved over and over and over throughout the history of Israel and over and over in your life and mine that he is more faithful to us than we are faithful to him. And you would think that through the history of Israel, because of what they had done so many times in turning their back, God would have lost his patience and lost his love and ridded them on the face of the earth. But God is faithful, not faithless, and he loves us so, and he's, he's conditioned to continue to love each and every person to draw them closer unto him. So there's a lot to be grateful for that God is patient in your life and mine, that he is a God who looks out for us even when we're not looking out for ourselves. that God is present even though we may not recognize his presence at the time, that God is a powerful and awesome God. So the subject matter this morning obviously is about gratitude, demonstrating our gratitude to God. And it's found in 2 Samuel in verses 6, 6 through 21. And when you look at that passage, you think, well, this is not a passage I would go to to think about gratefulness, but yet when we dive into it and think about the expression that David did and all that he had around him, then you can understand uh, gratitude and happiness for what we have is, is many times should be expressed beyond what we can imagine or think. So what does gratitude mean? Looking up that definition... And understanding what gratitude means, it can basically mean this, just to try to simplify it. It's the state of being appreciative for benefits received. It is the state of being appreciative for the benefits received or the blessings that you receive. You know, from the perspective of the believer in Christ, it is a recognition as well as a deep sense of appreciation for what the Lord has lavishly benefited his child, you and me, with. Therefore, gratitude is a part of an attitude in life as well as a practice of demonstrating to God and to others that we are indeed full of thanksgiving. A person living in that state of gratitude is a person who enjoys not only the past but embraces the future, but at the same time of not ignoring the past and embracing the future, they realize they must enjoy the present. A man was being chased by a ferocious tiger. He ran um, until he came to the edge of the cliff. The tiger was coming and approaching very fast, almost like he's licking his chops. And as the tiger began to bear down on him, he grabbed a rope apparently left by a hiker, and he climbed down away from the tiger. As he climbed enough down to be out of sight of the tiger from that anxious bite, the man could see the tiger, as I said, licking his chops, waiting for him to come back up. The man looked down the cliff and noticed it was still 500 foot below. Then he looked up and he saw two mice beginning to gnaw on this rope that apparently they had been gnawing on for a while. So what should he do? The tiger above or the rocks below? And the rope about to break. And as he's sizing up the situation that he notices right there in the rocks are some strawberries, wild strawberries growing out of the cliff. So he stretched out his hand and he plucked the strawberry and he put it in his mouth. The juices of the strawberry was so sweet that he ate, ate and ate as much as he could 
kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, the point of the story is this. Had the man been preoccupied with the past, the tiger, or been preoccupied with the future, 500 foot below of rocks, he would have never enjoyed the present, the strawberry. So gratitude may then be more of an expression that's deep within us of what we receive now and in our present situation. Well-rounded gratitude may be the demonstration of the giver, God himself, who's gifted us with many benefits and many blessings, and yet we give God our gratitude for all those things that we have. Well, the part of David's story is a story of exuberation, of finding expression in the form of dance, all defined through the attitude of gratitude that David had. Now, in 2 Samuel 6, verses 6 through 21, when he came to Nacon's threshold, Uzra reached out to the ark of God, took hold of it, and because the oxen had stumbled. Then the Lord's anger burned against Uzza, and God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence. And he died there next to the ark of God. David was angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzza, so he named the place the outburst against Uzza, as it is today. David feared the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? So he was not willing to move the ark of the Lord to the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Odabdeum and the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house three months. Now down in verse 12, it was reported that King David, the Lord has blessed Obadiah's family and, belong, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and had the ark of God brought up from Obadiah's house to the city of David with rejoicing. When those carrying the ark of the Lord advanced six steps, he sacrificed the ox and the fatted calf. David was dancing with all his might before the Lord wearing a linen cloth. He and his whole house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of the ram's horn. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter, Michal, looked, looking, looked down from the window, saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent David had set up for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord's presence. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed a loaf of bread, a date cake, a raisin cake to each of the whole multitude of the people of Israel, both men and women. Then all the people left, each to his own home. When David returned home to bless his household, Saul's daughter, Michal, came out to meet him. How the king of Israel honored himself today, she said. He exposed himself today in the sight of the slave girls of his subjects like a vulgar person would expose himself. David replied to Michal, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me over your father and his whole family to appoint me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will humble myself even more and humiliate myself. David, now you look at this passage, you say, well, Pastor, how in the world is this a Thanksgiving message? Where well, it is. It's all about an attitude and a heart of gratitude. Now, you've got to take it in context. The Ark of the Covenant was an ark that was transported with the people. It was the representation that God's presence was with the people. And inside that ark were three things that they kept, and it was very important. And they traveled that ark. And the whole idea was when they got to the place where they needed to build the temple, the ark of covenant would be the central part of that temple. And so here was one Uzra who, was, who just happened to stumble. The, the, the word was given. No one is to touch the ark of the covenant except one, the priest that was assigned to do so. If you touch it, you will die. And Uzra, unfortunately, stumbled touched the ark, 
and he died. Now, that's the sad part of the story. And it angered David because David's now thinking, my friend is no longer with me. And also, then if he can't touch it, how can I touch it? So how is this ark going to go with me as I travel as a person, as a leader for this nation? And so he's up in the air. And in the process, things began to work out. And all that began to happen. And so they devised a plan, and the ark of the covenant was now in David's presence and was traveling with them as they go. And so as a point of gratitude, David is recognizing the presence of God in his life. He's recognizing that God's presence is so vitally important. And realizing that that presence is a blessing, David is full of joy, and he's exuberant in that joy, and he's expressive in that joy, and he begins to dance in the street mindful of the fact that he's very skimpy in clothing. He's not completely exposed, but all he's got is a very thin linen cloth around his private area, and he's dancing. Well, his wife doesn't get the whole motion that's happening, literally, and she's up in the air about it. So here we understand that David is finding such an expression to God in the form of dance to say to God, I'm thankful for what you have provided and a solution that you have provided so that I know that everywhere I go, your presence is with me. And I am thankful for your presence. I am grateful for your presence. And I applaud you, God, that your presence is with me, even in my state of anger, even in my state of confusion. I I realize your presence is real. Each and every one of us will express our gratitude in many different forms, whether it's through something celebrative in an outward form, enjoying a meal with a family, or maybe a private conversation with a public demonstration. We'll do that. We'll express our gratefulness some way or another. But although Scripture does not command how or what form of expression we use to demonstrate appreciation to God, it does command us to have a grateful heart, even in the face of difficulty, even in the face of the things going well, we're to have the expressing expression of our thankfulness to God. King David at this point in his career in service to God and the people was a man full of energy and a great desire to know God, to live for God. He was considered a man after God's own heart. And yet he wanted to really let God know, I thank you for what you have provided for me. The setting in this passage in 2 Samuel was that transporting of the ark, and it's the central area of worship. So when they they devised the plan and the ark was there, it was saying to David and everyone around him, you can worship me. I'm with you. And as I said, the symbol was God's presence with them, and yet the, the central part of their life was worshiping God. Now, understanding these tablets of stone written uh, in the Ten Commandments of tablets of stone placed inside that ark, a shrine for them, the very finger of God had written those commands and was inside that ark. So not only is it the presence of God, it's the work of God represented in that ark. So very important for them to realize that this represents the Lord's presence entering into the people's lives. So if they left the ark and walked away, they would be like walking away from God. But with the ark ahead of them and them following it, they were following God's presence. And when the ark stopped and they stopped, they entered into his presence. So it was very, very symbolic and very important. So we find, we find a man in his 30s leading thousands of men to war, yet a king who took the time to express his loyalty to God through the attitude or his gratitude. By doing so, we get a glimpse of David's worship life in the process. These are the areas of encouragement where you and I should focus not so much on the past or the present, I mean of the future, but more so on the present, pointing us toward what we have right now in our life, not what we missed or what we can't have, but what we have right now.
You might think it's easy for David to express gratitude because, after all, he was the king of a nation. He enjoyed his work. He was confident in the Lord. He was a powerful man with many people around him. But this was only the small part of David's life. He demonstrated to all who took time to notice the gratefulness that lies within his heart in the good as well as in the bad, in the happy as well as those sad times, in the strength or even in weakness, in times of failure as well as in times of blessing. So let's talk about demonstrating our gratitude. Number one, as David teaches us in verses 6 through 14 that we read, gratitude, we should be grateful to God in the face of tough times. We should be grateful to God in the face of tough times. The character closest to David's heart was Uzra, his friend. But Uzra disobeyed God, and by touching that ark, it resulted in his death. The ark so sacred to the people that no one was allowed to touch it except those who were assigned because it was holy ground. It was off limits. And yet in verse 8, it says that David became angry at God for punishing his friend. And he questioned how he was was going to continue to move the ark because he was afraid if he touched it, he would die. And as we know from the character of David, when David made a friend, he cherished that friend closest to his heart. So it bothered him. He was in grief, and he blurted out his anger to God. And by the time we get down to verse 14, it's recorded that David danced in the streets before God and for all the people. So tough times did not discourage David from being grateful to God for the things that he does have. Yes, he could have stayed in his anger for the thing that he didn't have anymore, his friend, but then he began to see the representation of the ark in its movement with him, and they worked out the plan of everything that was going to represent God's movement with the people, moving them closer to the idea of the central area of worship of their life, David became very grateful to God for everything that God allowed to happen because now David, even in the motions of anger and questioning, is celebrating in the middle of the streets in exuberation, giving thanks to God for his wonderful presence that is very powerful in his life. It was after that blessing of Obadiah's household that David realized God's confirmation. He realized God's care. It was continual in his life, in anyone else through their actions or in their belief. Therefore, David danced in the street even in those tough times. Second of all, in demonstrating gratitude, we can demonstrate gratitude even in the face of jealousy. David's wife was King Saul's daughter. You remember when King Saul, when David killed Goliath, King Saul at the time, who was only king for three days, he awarded David his daughter in marriage, Michal. And so he he married her and she became his wife and and they lived in happily ever after up to a certain point in their life. And this is one of those instances where David's father-in-law, Saul, had, had chased David for years. And out of bitterness, resentment, and hatred, over him being now chosen king over Israel, who's going to replace Saul, he dethroned Saul in this jealousy tendency Saul had towards David. David continued uh, to, to press on forward, and even in the bit of his daughter now, Michal, not understanding his exuberation, not understanding his form of expression, not understanding his grateful movements and dance, she looks at it, as a vulgar incident, and him exposing himself to younger women. And so she despised him in her heart. Now, I'm not saying husbands go out there and take your clothes off and dance in the street. You know, that's not what the whole sermon's about, but you just got to look in the context of what David was doing. So possibly she was angry at him because he gave so little attention to her and so much attention to others. Maybe she was angered because he was doing something in the form of in the public that he would never do with her. Regardless of the point, the worship life of David is being expressed here, and his gratefulness of his heart 
is obviously being recorded by those who are watching. If there is some strife within his wife, surely David was blind to the fact. He knew nothing was wrong long before it was noticed and noted through Scripture. Yet David demonstrated his gratitude in the face of jealousy, in which I believe he probably already had some inclination that it had already existed. It reminds me of a story I read where a woman was suffering from a depressed sense of intimacy within her marriage. So the husband, concerned over the matter, decided that it was agreement that they need to go see a psychiatrist. The doctor listened to the details of the couple as they, they walked through their relationship. And the treatment that the psychiatrist prescribed, and with that, went over to the man's wife, gathered her in his arms, and gave her the most lavished kiss right there in the office with her husband. Then he stepped back. He looked at the woman's glowing face and broad smile, and turning to the woman, the husband, he said, See, this, I mean, the psychiatrist turned to us, see, this is all she needs to put life back into her. Expressionless. The husband said, well, can I bring her back on Tuesdays and Thursdays? <laughs> Again, not an advice. You know, obviously a relationship is twofold. And yet one goes on, sometimes one goes and thinks nothing's wrong, and the other knows it is. Whether or not you are, see it or not, David and Mikhail, David, in spite of those desi- desi- despised feelings toward him, from his wife, demonstrated his gratefulness to God for what God had put in place. He was grateful. God's presence was with him. Number three in demonstrating gratitude is in the face of of tough times and jealousy. Number three is demonstrating gratitude in the face of ridicule. So there are times in our life we're going to face tough times. Does that mean we're not to be grateful? Surely not. We are to be even in tough times. Even when we have jealousy in our life, people may be jealous of what we do and what we have, where we go, what we accomplish. We still can be grateful to God. Even in the the matter of being ridiculed, of someone uh, looking down on us. As David returned to his home, his wife came out to the street and says, Oh, David, how glorious you must feel parading yourselves in the streets for all those young ladies to see, shamelessly, without fault revealing yourself to them. That's kind of the paraphrase of her expression. She was accusing him of showboating. And David wasn't showboating. He was saying to God, thank you, God. Thank you for all those things. He was happy. And it, and it caused his feet to move and his heart to pound. And it got him in movement and he, and he expressed it through dance. David, as a form of gratitude in that culture, was doing something that was not shameful. He was finding full expression to God, and it was through dance. He was saying, this is how I'm saying, I'm communicating to God. Thank you for your blessings. I'm not going to have to travel without the presence of God. I'm not going to be a king without the presence of God. I'm not going to be one who leads without the presence of God. God's presence is with me, and I give you thanks, and I give you praise that even in my leadership, even in my kingship, even in my doubts, your presence is with me. And he's thankful for all those things, and now he's being ridiculed for his expression. It's easy to have a grateful heart and express to God everything in thankfulness when everything is going right. When everybody loves you and is ready to embrace you, shake your hand, pat you on the back. But in this passage, it was not his power, it was not his prestige, it was not his position that made him grateful. You don't hear him saying, I'm grateful to God because I am king. He doesn't say, I'm grateful to God because of all the the monetary things I have. He's not saying, I'm grateful to God because I've got thousands of people protecting me, and everywhere I go, they'd have to break through those men in order to get to me. He's not saying any of that. He's thankful to God in the face of grief, in the face of strife, in the face of ridicule, and it leads, leads him to express to God, thank you, God, for what I have. So even in the face of those things in our life, the questions we have, the times where we feel lonely, the times where we feel drained, the times where we are confused, we can be thankful for what God has given us. 
maybe not those things we need to look out in front of us that we can grab a hold and say, this is something I've accomplished, even though that can be a blessing. But the things that are within us, and yet you, you knowing Christ, you have freedom, freedom from the penalty of your own sin and death. In Christ, you have the promise of abundant life. You have peace. You have patience and love and joy. You have all those things that only God can give. And so we can be grateful to God even when we're hurting, even when we're confused, even when we're baffled. We can be grateful to God. And this leads us to the fourth and last of demonstrating gratitude. We can demonstrate gratitude, obviously, in the face of blessing. And you find that in verse 21 and 22 that David that we read about David in that story. David, notice, is resolved now to worship in a time of persecution as well as in a time of blessing. He acknowledged God's call in his life. And to that, even to his wife as well, he realizes his blessing is from God. And he concludes, he says, wait, dear. He said, I am celebrating before the Lord and to him only. I didn't ask for an audience. I didn't ask for anybody to look. I didn't ask for anybody to parade themselves. All I'm doing is I started the dance and no one was around and everybody took notice and they're seeing things that I'm not doing because I'm giving God thanks and I don't have enough room inside that house and I'll kill you if I dance too hard. So I had to go out on the streets and I'm giving God my joy. I'm giving God my heart. He's given me blessing after blessing after blessing. His presence is powerful. His presence is real. His presence is mighty. And I thank God for that presence. And I'm dancing to that tune. And I'm saying to God, I love you, God, and thank you for all that you are to me. Okay, David, you want some apple pie then? <laughs> I'm sure he put, him, put her in a place. David didn't claim personal credit. You don't see that here. He does not, he's, not, he's not saying, look what I've done. He's not talking about the task of, of the huge task of moving even the ark to the central place of worship for all the people. It's not those, those things are not important. He did not claim to be a hero. He's not claiming to be a mighty warrior to the people or a savior to the people. He gave God all the credit. He gave God all the honor for all the great work in David's life. And a part of having and living a life of worship is the attitude of gratitude demonstrated to an awesome God over the great work that he has done for each of us. You see, the key for David in such an expression was in that he was remaining lightly esteemed or humbled through it all. He did not think of himself as the proud and high and mighty one. He was just a mere servant serving God in the streets, expressing his gratitude to God. So even in the midst of grief or those tough times, even in the midst of his, the jealousy that was happening between Saul and carried over to his wife, even in the midst of the ridicule of being accused of something of wrongdoing, he could give God blessing back because of the blessing that God has given to him. So how about your demonstration of gratitude? The scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Someone once said, thankfulness leaves no room for discouragement. There's a legend of a man who found a barn where Satan kept all his seeds to be sown in the human heart. And finding the seeds of discouragement, they were more numerous than the seeds of the present. He learned that the seeds could be made to grow almost anywhere. When Satan was questioned, he reluctantly admitted that there was one place in which he could not get the seed to thrive. And where is that? That's the man. Satan replied, in the heart of a grateful person. So how, how about your gratitude, your demonstration of gratitude? Do you spend enough time demonstrating gratitude to God? 
Do you spend enough time demonstrating your gratitude to God? There's, is there anything you need to request of God or anything you need to confess to God? You know, we, we're not talking about Thanksgiving Day here filled with a lot of turkey and food and family and gatherings and chatter and chitter and all that sort of stuff that happens in our home. Although that's, that's good, it's fun, and it's fattening. But we're talking about what happens every day. You know, yeah, there's, there's a lot to complain about. <laughs> a political world we live in today, there's a, there's a lot to, to, to kind of take a step back because of the dangers we have today, the shootings and so forth, the rumors of war. There's a lot to question when it comes to the financial stability of a nation, of our individual retirement accounts, when the market's up and down. There's a lot to question. There's a lot to be concerned about, yes. But you know what? There's nothing that could happen. A war could happen tomorrow. A stock market could crash in the morning. Your job could be lost with a pink slip. But there's so much more to be grateful for what you have now that God has given you as a believer, as a child of His, knowing that you're in His protection and you're in His care. Now, I say all this because if you've never come to know Christ, then there, what, what, are, you, what are you really living for? What are you, who are you really grateful to? Today's the day. Say to God, God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Because I, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live something beyond who I am. What I, what I, want, to, I want to live to what I have been created to be by a create, creator. We're all the creator's kids. <laughs> you ever thought about that? We're all the creator's kids. We must align our, our lives with the creator. So if you've never committed your life to Christ, there's no greater time than right now. Well, how is it done? You know, it's very simple. We complicate everything. I know I do. We complicate this, that, or the other. Systematically, we try to put everything in place. It's just basically saying, dear Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. I recognize you as Lord and Savior. Save me. That's all it takes. Will you do that today? If for some reason you you feel more with bitter and complaints, then why not just fine-tune the lens? Just like a eye doctor does when you go get your eyes checked. You look through those lenses and they're blurred. And he starts tweaking them a little bit or she starts tweaking them a little bit. And they get a little bit more in focus, a little bit more in focus, a little bit more in focus. You say, okay, that's it. Well, fine-tune what you do have. Let go of the things that seem to cloud your vision. And be grateful to God for who he is and what he has done for you. Let's pray together. Father God, we, we want to thank you. Thank you that you allow us uh, to come before you with a heart of thanksgiving, a heart filled with blessing, to recognize you not only as Lord of the universe, but Lord of our individual lives, to recognize that when we pray, heaven becomes silent. When we cry out to you, your hand of guidance is here recognizing the fact that, that you're patient and you're faithful to us even when we are impatient and faithless to you. Father God, thank you for being one who cares for us when we sleep and when we wake, when we go afar, when we're near, when we as far as the east is from the west, when we arise, when we sit, you're there, your presence is powerful. That you knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. You know every hair that's counted on our head. Lord, thank you for knowing us personally, creating us as a being to serve you and honor you. Thank you, God, for all the blessings that you have given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of our own sin, the life of abundance we could live, and the promise of everlasting life when we breathe our last breath on the face of this earth. We're grateful, God, that you're a God who looks out for us even when we're not aware of danger. We're grateful to God because of, of you, God, because of everything that you have put in place, all the appointments and all the divine 
uh, happenings around us, the people that you have placed in our life, the children you have given us, the grandchildren you have given us, the spouses you have given us, the work environments we have, relationships, the people that have been encouraging and uplifting. We thank you. But thank you, God, most of all, that we know you as Abba, Father, our Daddy, in your name that we pray. Amen. My friend, our hymn of invitation this morning, our hymn of commitment is Amazing Grace. As we sing that together, may our hearts be refreshed as we realize that grace that has impacted each of us and changed us and who we are. So let's stand together. Let's sing. It's great. 